periodicities and red shifts, do they undermine the Big Bang? From the 1970s, reports such as this showing that galaxies tended to favour multiples of 72 kilometres per second in their velocities began to appear by people such as William Tift, Pelton Arp, Geoffrey and Margaret Burbage, and others associated with Sir Fred Hoyle. A number of these people can be seen in this conference, which they all attended uh, on the memorial of Sir Fred Hoyle, a very great man. Uh, I was there too, at the far back right. So what could these quantized red shifts, as they became called, mean? What do they mean for the Big Bang? Following the early reports of the 72 kilometer per second quantization, um, many astronomers were skeptical. Others of, who were even skeptical ones who did studies and followed the correct procedure as outlined by Tift soon found things like this Guthrie and Napier result showing very clearly many cycles of 72 kilometers per second in galaxy red shifts. On much larger scales, it was found that there were things called mega walls across space. And this, this study done in 1990 shows the huge walls of galaxies at very regular intervals, a spacing which is reported in the strange way astronomers do as being at 128 megaparsecs, which actually is at 586 million light years when the correct Hubble constant is used. In three dimensions, these clusters of galaxies were found to form almost a matrix. I found that almost any sample of galaxies, when analysed correctly, will show peaks at these places such as this one, saying period is here 72, 144, 219, multiples of 72, again at around 36 and 24 also, for, um, other samples of what Tift has also found. So if these redshift periodicities or quantizations are real, if galaxies really like to have particular velocities relative to each other, what does it mean for the Big Bang? Well, it's hard to imagine how the, they could have such velocities if there was a Big Bang, because certain situations would have to lead to there being other velocities than these ones, and you couldn't have this type of situation going on. As an example, if you had um, two stars travelling away from us in right angle directions at 72 kilometres per second, then relative to each other, according to the Big Bang, they would have the square root of 2 times 72 kilometres per second, clearly not a multiple of 72. In the more general case of random directions in space, even if everything were travelling away from us at 72 kilometres per second, there'd be all sorts of different velocities between these other galaxies. So we would have to ask the question, are we in a special place in the universe if everything can only do 72 kilometres per second relative to us, but not relative to all other galaxies? Very few scientists would want to accept that we are at a special place in the universe. So we are reduced to the conclusion that the um, galaxies are not all racing away from us in little circular spherical walls. It's almost like the ancients idea of crystal spheres of instead of the stars, the galaxies are arranged on concentric crystal spheres. This is what it would be required if velocity, if redshift really meant velocity and the velocity was a measure of distance. Clearly this cannot be so if the quantized redshifts are real. So this is why so many astronomers have simply ignored the evidence, hoping that if they ignore it long enough it will go away. But it doesn't go away. When I began to debate this in an astronomy forum with a, a lot of astronomers, they told me, but none of the results from the larger surveys support this, and these small surveys that these people did therefore cannot be accepted. So I began to ask further questions and I did analysis based on larger surveys, and I found it was still there. But I found that the majority of the large surveys that they referred me to uh, simply didn't have accurate enough data. Tift has shown quite clearly you need accuracy of something like 10 or 15 kilometers per second 
if you're going to detect a periodicity of 72 kilometers per second. But many of these other databases had accuracy of only 30 or 50 or more kilometers per second, insufficient for the purpose. So is there some way that we can explain these redshift periodicities and still explain all the other observations? Um, but we would obviously have to throw the big bang out to do that. Yes, there is an answer. It has been put forward by Navika and supported by Health and Art that uh, the masses of particles are not something that is constant over time. And the idea is that particles it, it gain mass according to the communication they have at the speed of light with other particles in the universe. This is a natural idea that follows from the understanding that particles are a wave structure and that they communicate their waves going outwards and inwards at the speed of light with other particles in the universe. So if particles increase with time in mass, what is the consequence of that? The formulas for the spectral lines of all elements um, depend on the mass of the nucleus. So if the mass of particles was increasing with time, the frequencies of all spectral lines would increase. In other words, they'd move towards the blue. That means that if we saw any galaxy as it was in the distant past, we would see it when the light from all galaxies was more red, and it would appear red shifted. And we would get the same proportionality. The further away it was, the further we are looking back in time, the further we would see it shifted red compared to the current faster, higher frequencies of the galaxies. And Health and Arp has found much other evidence that supports this idea of Nalakars. For example, he finds that the quasars, which is at very high red shifts, um, are actually associated with the axis of galaxies. So we have a galaxy here. Out the, the two axes come quasars. And pairs of quasars with the same red shift are often found at matching distances on either side along the axis of a galaxy. Uh, according to him, these are new uh, matter that has just been formed by the ejection of huge amounts of energy from the core of a galaxy. The result of this is that they have a much lower frequency until that matter comes into contact with other matter at the speed of light. And then it moves down in steps, its, its red shift becoming less and less until after a long period of time it comes more or less in line with the frequencies of other galaxies and is no longer red shifted. He's found plenty of examples of these and the evidence is very good. Here is other evidence that shows the same sort of thing. So what we reduce to is the idea that galaxies are not really in a state of motion, apart from for very short times when they're ejected uh, from as new galaxies, as quasars from uh, existing galaxies, that they're all actually more or less at rest relative to each other and the universe is actually a stable thing that has existed for an extremely long time. Fred Hoyle came to the same conclusion based on other grounds, such as the time it actually takes for life to develop. So this is something that is an alternative. It's a realistic alternative to the Big Bang. It solves many problems that the Big Bang ignores, and it doesn't have any problems of its own. Going one step further, we can say that the consequence of matter increasing in mass over time does lead uh, to quantized steps in that increased mass. And this is the reason for the steps in red shift as matter goes up in little increments, um, its frequency changing. And this idea is one which we'll develop further in other videos, but it's the source of explaining um, how the universe works much better.